So that's actually where this story takes a really random but fascinating turn uh, into Fun Facts Land. <laughs> So it's my Neander, favorite place. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. We, I think, part of our um, discipline on this show is not to get too lost in Fun Facts Land, but we're definitely going to take a trip there today. And we're back with another episode of Him Partial, the podcast where we talk all things church music. I'm Cara Devereaux, and I'm Monet Funka. And today we're going to be talking about the hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. What's this song got to do with the first archaic fossil of man? Translating hymns is a lot harder than we think. And as usual, we're going to see where these themes come from in scripture. All that and more if you stay tuned. Yeah, but before we jump in, if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. You can follow us on social media at Himpartial, or you can visit our website, himpartial.com, where you can sign up for our completely free and completely awesome weekly newsletter, where we bring all our newest episodes fresh to your inbox. Yes, yes, yes. So, wow, wee, wow, wow. <laughs> this song has really taken me on a journey, and I'm really excited to dig in. Um, our song today was born in my husband's fatherland, Germany. <laughs> Yay! Yay, <laughs> Germany. Uh, the writer of this hymn um, was a well known reformed teacher theologian and poet, of course, and hymn writer named Joachim Neander. It's going to be a lot of German in this episode. Just get ready. (laughs) So Joachim was born in Bremen, Germany, a place I've actually been to, which is sort of random. And he spent a lot of his time teaching and preaching in the Dussel Valley, uh, which is near Dussel door, I'm pretty sure. Um, it's a beautiful place that inspired many of his poems, but he didn't start out as a Christian. He was kind of a teenage troublemaker of sorts, and he and some fellow students attended a church service basically to be amused by the preacher and his ramblings. But praise God, he was convicted. And he ended up meeting with the preacher, Mr. Theodor Underek, someone else who was influential in the German Reformed Church. And after this, Neander experienced a conversion and lived a new dedicated life for Jesus. Praise God. That's that's so cool. I love when people are like, yeah, I'm going to slag Christianity. And then God's just like, no, you're not. (laughs) Psych. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's really great. Um, So along with being a poet, theologian, and hymn writer, he was also a Latin teacher. Um, And while his relationship with the Latin school he taught at was not always the best, I do think that this gave him a lot of notoriety in the community. Um, And given his other talents for preaching and poetry, he kind of made a name for himself in this area. So that's actually where this story takes a really random a fascinating turn uh, into Fun Facts Land. <laughs> so it's my Neander, place. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. We, I think, part of our um, discipline on this show is not to get too lost in Fun Facts Land, but we're definitely going to take a trip there today. Um, so, Neander spent a lot of his time in the Dussel Valley, which I mentioned before, um, and that inspired all of his hymns about God's creation. And, you know, just it's a beautiful land. I don't don't know if if you've ever been to Germany, but Germany in general is just a very beautiful country um, that has a complicated history, as a lot of our countries do. But um, in honor of Neander, Germany actually renamed the valley where he spent all of his time writing these poems to Neandertal, which just means Neander Valley. I think you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> I'm beginning to make the fossil connections. <laughs> yes. So I don't know why this was so impressive to me. This is just a random fact, but this valley, Neandertal, is where they excavated the first archaic human, um, which they just named Neanderthal 1 because that's where they found it. So 
Is that not wild? Like this supposed prehistoric version of man, this like big discovery in 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 science, is named after a hymn writer, <laughs> like a Christian hymn writer. <laughs> it's great. It's funny the way things work out. <laughs> it is, and I I thought I wouldn't have said it that way because in German there's not a th sound, there's not a th, so it is Neanderthal. That's how you would say it, but. In English, we say Neanderthal, right? That's how we would say it. And so I just, I mean, I'm really fascinated by language, but this really, fa <laughs> I'm like really geeking out about this. And I guess I'm kind of tempted, but I won't to really talk about the whole evolution and the actual aging of this particular creature and stuff. But I do, I do find it a little bit maybe ironic that this um, discovery that was supposed to show be some sort of evidence of evolution is actually like named after a Christian who likely didn't believe any of that stuff. So I don't know. Is that just me stretching it? I think God gets his giggles in sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Although since we're in random fact land, I was watching, I was watching a random Amazon documentary the other day, and it's like historical X Files, um, and one of them was the skull that Darwin got hold of that mm -hmm. was supposed to be the missing link, mm -hmm. and they were like investigating it, and they found out that it was actually a hoax, um, and it was part human skull, and the other part was like an orang part of the orangutan jaw that had been attached to create an ape-like like thing. On. So yeah, so. Just wow. fun facts about all this reliable evolutionary science. Yeah, yeah. It's another it's another tangent that we'll talk about offline. But yeah, I just I yep. just thought that was really, really funny. <laughs> so Neander was a big deal. Many of his hymns were quickly accepted into the Lutheran hymn books and are still being used today. No surprise there. But I really believe the crowning jewel of of his piece is this song. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Um, now, the obvious thing to mention that probably actually isn't too obvious, but I'll just say it anyway. This hymn was not written in English. <laughs> its original language was German because Neander was German and he lived in Germany. Um, and because I love to embarrass myself on this show for your entertainment, um, I'm actually going to say the title in German. <laughs> it will both make my husband proud and embarrassed. So the original title of this song is called Lobe den Herren den Machtigen König der Ehren. Are you impressed? It sounds legit to me because I don't speak German. <laughs> But I'm sure if your husband taught you to say it, then it was a really good attempt. <laughs> I mean, I kind of just said it. And I said, does that sound right? And he was like, well, kind of. I wouldn't be able to understand you. But we have to keep in mind, too, that this is like old German. So it roughly translates to mean praise the Lord, the mighty king of honor. That's right. That's roughly what it means. So feel free to mock me. Um, <laughs> but I actually think that even just that rough translation kind of brings us to an important topic that we can only really tease in this episode, mainly to do with my lack of knowledge in this area. But I was fascinated by it. And that is translations. The most popular version of this song was translated by a lady called Catherine Winkworth. And Catherine was a British hymn writer and teacher, and she spent a year in Dresden, Germany, <clears throat> where she took an interest in German hymnody. And that's when she began her works of translating several hymns into English. She did a great service to the church. Uh, but like with all translations, there can be controversy of how and with what lens you translate. We obviously see this all the time with Bible translations and people having very, you know, strong views on which um, version is the best or the truest to the original and which one is more dynamic as in it's easier for us to understand. And there's obviously cultural lenses there above my pay grade, but we see this in, 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 church music as well. We talked about it a bit on our exclusive psalmody episode. There's obviously something to be said about folks who are 
uh, taking a song that is now a psalm that is now in English and then trying to give it a meter uh, when it's removed from its original language, which was Hebrew. Do you have any initial thoughts on that? I think it's really interesting that you picked up on that because next week we're going to be talking about that too. <laughs> but if anybody out there translates hymns or knows someone who translates hymns, it would be a really interesting conversation to have. So, um, you know, if you know anybody like that, we'd love to be put in touch because I think that would make like a really interesting episode. Yeah, Because definitely. like translating like normal speech is hard enough trying to translate like metaphor and everything and then still translate it into a meter that's singable yeah. must be particularly um, hard. <laughs> Gotta have <Yeah>. special skills. <laughs> so we, we will get into a bit of that right now. Basically, there was this priest um, uh, in, in, in England um, who... I guess he was somewhat of a historian. He created this book called A Dictionary of Hym Hymnology. And in that book, he criticized uh, Chris, Chris, uh, sorry, Catherine Winkworth about her translation from the German to the English. He basically said that in her song, she used themes of muscular Christianity. Have you ever heard of this, this term before? No. It sounds a little bit feminist and patriarchy, to be honest. I honestly feel the same. I was like, to me, this sounds like really lefty and made up, like, you know, toxic mac I mean, masculinity or like what mansplaining. Is muscular. Like, come on. Yeah. You're going to have to explain it now because yeah, it's I will. weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently it's just referring to like a cultural trend in the West. And in this case, specifically in Britain, where like strength and stamina and physical fitness were elevated in society as being virtuous, particularly within Christians. Um, and this criticism is, is found particularly in the first verse. The original song reads... Some more German for you. Get ready. <laughs> the original song, uh, the second line of the first verse says, Meine geliebetet Zale, das ist mein Geberin, which roughly means my loved soul, you are my desire. And Catherine translates that to say, oh, my soul, praise him for he is thy health and salvation. That's very different. It's very different. Now, if we're going to go match for match on this verse, I can see his criticism. It's like, well, where did you get that health and salvation stuff? That's your like British, you know, muscular Christianity. <laughs> Sorry, it just makes me laugh. It just sounds stupid. It's probably legit, but I, I just find it a little bit amusing. But um, in the original song, there are five verses, but in Catherine's translation, there's only four. So did she skip a verse? No, she actually sort of mashes the themes of the song and, and puts it into four verses, takes the German five and puts them into four. So in verse two, it reads, warning, German alert, more Germans coming. In, in verse two, it reads on the second line, der dich gesundheit verliehen dich freundlich geleitet. Again, is that that's just gibberish. What it roughly means is he who bestow who he who bestows you health and guides you kindly. So he clearly has themes about God giving you health and, and your guidance and stuff. So it's really difficult to say, was she reading her British context into the song, her muscular Christianity, or was <laughs> she just bringing the themes of the original song into an English context to the best of her ability? What do you think? I think it's hard to know because we don't know her, but I imagine it would be probably a bit of both because we're often blind to our own cultural biases and stuff so she may have been doing it to the best of her ability without realizing that 
some of her culture was playing into it. Yeah. Yeah, and and obviously we cannot translate devoid of our culture, but um, as they are songs of praise, and you know, this is a poem esque type of uh, uh, of context. I do think there is room for creative license in translations, um, and maybe I don't necessarily know how I feel about muscular Christianity being a valid theme to pick up on as if it's not I mean because when I looked this up they were like well muscular Christianity can be traced back to Paul and I'm like okay well then you mean Christianity because (laughs) the apostle Paul wasn't like I'm gonna just write in some of my own culture thing you know because he talks about you know an athlete who um you know trains himself and all that stuff and uh for the goal of the wreath right you know he's taking off all of the the things that don't matter and focusing on training himself. And that's like, oh, that's the roots of cultural, you know, what do you call it? Muscular Christianity. And it's like, well, that's just the roots of Christianity. Like, that's just a theme that comes up. That's not like some weird British context. It's so, like saying like, oh, uh, Psalm 23 is really drawing on that, you know, farming Christianity <laughs> thing. And it's like, well... Images are helpful. It's not necessarily yeah. like, I don't know. I understand it. I, I know there's similar themes. This is a little bit tangent land, but there are similar criticisms about Christianity in America, for example, a lot. And especially from my British friends, they'll be like, it's so weird, like how patriotic, like your Christians are. There's like all this overlap. And, you know, as a, as an American, I'm like, Okay, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being patriotic, but obviously we can't have idolatry creeping into the church. So it it could be similarly aligned, like maybe there's too much of an emphasis on it, but that's that's above my pay grade. I don't really understand what would be the, the major criticism on that uh, on that front. But I did think it was interesting because this was mentioned right alongside the translation as if like her translating it was like ah 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 like because there's many other translations of this song hers just happens to be the most popularly used um and there is i'm sure other cultural contexts to the other translations as well so it's just having that creative license and having a bit of grace to say are we getting to the heart of what the original was trying to say without um you know kind of distorting it too much it's a it's a hard it's a hard thing i think So, now for the tune. (laughs) Uh, This is probably me burying the lead a little bit here, but as far as hymn tune writers are concerned, this is probably the most famous one that we've ever spoken of on this show. Do you know who actually wrote the tune to this song? I have no idea. Like, I know the tune, I'm singing it in my head, but I, I don't know who wrote it. Well... The the writer of the song was some little guy named Johann Sebastian Bach. No way, really? Yeah. That's so cool. I know, it's really cool. Um I was like I told I told my husband, I was like, Do you know who wrote the tune? And he was like, Bach. And I was like, Of course you know, because like you guys are looking <laughs> like it's like Germany, rah rah rah, I don't know, whatever their fight song is. Um <laughs> But there there is actually a time gap between Um, Neander's life and Bach's life. Um, Neander was born in 1650 and died in 1680 uh, at only 30 uh, from tuberculosis. So he had a crazy short life considering how impactful he was to this region of Germany. Um, But obviously this song was still part of the German culture for some time because Bach composed his chorale cantata in 1725. So quite a a while later after Neander's life. So I'm not quite sure what they were singing it to before 
Bach, but he's kind of like the eclipse that made all the other versions unnecessary. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, oh yeah, Bach made you a version. Yeah, those are the ones we could just put those right in the trash. Yeah, uh, <laughs> can you imagine being a songwriter and trying to compete with Bach? Yeah, <laughs> You're like I wrote this tune, and then along comes Bach, like I wrote one too. It's like there's no competition. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's that's still the tune we use today. There's there's really not been anything else to compare with that one. That one was the heavy hitter. So what is that? 300 years of being number one in terms of this song. So crazy popular because of the composer. Uh, maybe not so much because of the writer, but the composer obviously put it on the map um, on a global scale because of his his series of works being so popular any thoughts on that Cara um you actually had me thinking about I think there are other hymns that we sing where the tunes are written by like Bach and Handel and things but like I can't think of one off the top of my head <laughs> I can't either <laughs> I don't have that that wealth of knowledge just yet but maybe no. one day yeah, I'm not classically trained, so like that's about as good as it gets from me. But you are classy. <laughs> oh, always. <laughs> always, always. <laughs> Pardon. <laughs> so um, we can't have an episode without looking at the word um, and s seeing where we get these lovely lyrics from the scripture both the English and the German ones. So I thought it would be a good idea to look at what inspired these words. Uh, while we know Neander loved the, uh, the German countryside, um, it wasn't the countryside that inspired him. It was the God who made the countryside. And we see a lot of the themes from this song in Psalm 103. So Cara, do you mind reading that uh, verses one to five? Yeah, sure. So it reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Amen. Amen. And there's obviously so much, like, there's imagery there of God's creation as well. And there's a little bit of muscular Christianity in there. I mean, he's <laughs> healing you from diseases and giving you life. <laughs> I'm to I know I'm totally butchering that phrase, but I, I just thought I would point that out. Um, so actually, the next verse that was the inspiration for this particular hymn, we've read on this show before, but... I have no problem repeating the scriptures because Lord knows I need to hear it more than once. It's actually Psalm 150. So I'm just going to read it in its entirety because it's a very short hymn. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tim timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise Amen the Lord. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that psalm. Any final thoughts on this song, on this hymn writer, on all of the crazy history involved in, in, uh, in Neander's life? Um, only to say thank you for sharing it all, because to be honest, like it's one of those songs that's just kind of there and, you know, you're like, oh, we're singing this one and you just sing it and you don't really think about it. But now that I know how mental it was, I'm <laughs> kind of like, I'm going to sing it in a whole new light now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's the best part of this show for me personally is that. Now, every time I pick up those songs, I'm thinking about the history. I'm thinking about um, who was behind it and how that feeds into these beautiful lyrics that we have to sing as a church. 
So I hope that that's blessing all you guys in the same way. But that just about wraps it up for us on another episode of Him Partial. If you liked what you heard today, please make sure you share this episode with your friends, your family, your cat, your dog, whoever is around to listen. It'd be great. We'd love to welcome them to the Him Partial family. But until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Bye. Bye.